Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our October uh, roundtable for the Bancroft Library. Um, we're happy to host Ron Hasner, a uh, professor in political sciences, who will be speaking to us on his new book on uh, torture. So, Christine? Yes. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all again after our uh, summer break. So I'd like to, it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Ron Hasner. He's the Chancellor's Professor of Political Science and the Helen Diller Family Chair in Israel Studies here at the UC Berkeley campus. He's also the Faculty Director of the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies and is the editor of the Cornell University Press book series, Religion and Conflict. Professor Hasner studies the role of ideas, practices, and symbols in international security with particular attention to the relationship between religion and violence. Uh, this roundtable comes at the heels of a number of different events that, um, that Ron Hasner and Jose Adrian have put on. So we are very pleased today to hear more from Ron Hasner about his book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you everybody for attending. I'm glad to see some uh, familiar faces in the audience. Hi, Diana. And I'm also seeing Peter here. Um, so super happy to uh, talk to you again. Um, and I'll start with gratitude, not just for this invitation, but also for uh, for all the work that the Bancroft has done uh, in hosting my students and my colleagues who've been able to see some of these manuscripts in the last few days. And uh, we had a, a big exhibit opening at the Magnus on Tuesday that some of you were <clears throat> were able to attend. So I will uh, take about half an hour, maybe 25 minutes to talk about uh, to talk about my book. I am, because I'm on slide mode, I will not be able to see the questions that you're typing in, but I'm hoping that these questions will slowly pile up and that will then leave us uh, with half an hour to, to talk about those questions. So my book is called Anatomy of Torture and it comes from uh, um, a discourse in the United States after 9-11 uh, where people had very, very strong feelings for or against interrogational torture, this idea of cap capturing terrorism suspects and interrogating them forcefully uh, using pain and the threat of pain in order to extract information. I, as a political scientist, found that discourse to be uh, very shallow uh, for two reasons. First, because people mostly uh, engaged in wishful thinking, those who, who thought that torture would be a good way to prevent terrorist acts argued that it was effective. Those who thought the torture should not be used to interrogate terrorists argued that it would be ineffective. Um, so that's that's already sort of, for me, it sends off all sorts of alarm bells. Um, th that was one issue. But then the bigger issue was that we simply have no information. The CIA has not revealed to us who they have tortured, how often they have tortured them, how they tortured them, and what the results were. In fact, upon further investigation, I discovered that no 20th or 21st century government has revealed much about its torture. We don't know much about the KGB. We don't know anything about uh, the Gestapo use of torture uh, other than anecdotes. Uh, we have no systematic data on the French in Algeria, on the Americans in Vietnam. Um, work and arguments for and against torture are based on wild speculation, uh, really guesswork and wishful thinking. So uh, what I wanted was a, a database that first offered me a large set of cases, cases of torture and non-torture, cases in which torture yielded information and didn't yield information. I wanted that source to be relatively unbiased. And I uh, had some preference uh, for uh, a source that was uh, far back in time so that it afforded me some moral distance so that I could talk about what happened and analyze the data um, without having you know, the eyes of perpetrators and victims on me. Uh, and it turns out that the Spanish Inquisition was uh, one such source of information. It was a very, very impressive uh, um, data set. I'm showing you here uh, some, some of the many dozens of locations in which the Spanish Inquisition uh, engaged in torture, the number of documents available to scholars is in the many tens of thousands. Uh, we have um, many Inquisition documents here on uh, the Berkeley campus, uh, several dozens, including three that I will talk about at length. Uh, but, but the documents available on the internet in databases 
I was able to write to universities around the world and around the US. And they all sent me scans and summaries. Other scholars have uh, summarized these trials and, and coded them um, in, their, in their analyses. So there's a lot of information out there. And it's information from a while ago, which means that this is an argument by metaphor. I'm studying torture three, 400 years ago in order to very carefully learn lessons about torture today. And I'll say more about that caution. Um, but the numbers are uh, significant enough to allow me to provide uh, pretty robust conclusions. And what you see here in this image, by the way, is uh, one of the documents found uh, in the background. Um, uh, I, I used some of these documents to look at sort of uh, wide uh, patterns and data across decades. Uh, for example, in uh, Toledo, I got my hands on a, a data set of almost 1,100 cases that all happened consecutively. Those are all the cases that happened in Toledo in a period of about 30 years. Um, and so you can really detect broad patterns of, you know, how often are men tortured compared to women? How often are the elderly tortured compared to the young? Who collaborates and who doesn't? How many uh, Muslims are tortured versus how many Jews are tortured versus how many Protestants are tortured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then there are other cases, including the documents from the Bancroft, that allow me a deep dive. So rather than a lot of superficial information, a thousand and more cases, here, this relates to the uh, Inquisition in Mexico, specifically Mexico City, it was a deep dive into uh, about a dozen cases. Uh, you can see some of these cases on this family tree here, which Jose Adrian and I were able to create just looking at a set of, of trials. Uh, the, the trial documents are very extensive, they're very detailed, and they allow us to learn not just uh, how and who engaged in heresy, but also who was related to whom, what sort of relationships did they have, who taught whom, who prayed with whom, who were the neighbors, who butchered the kosher meat, who kept the holy scriptures, who was the rabbi of the community, uh, et cetera. So you can see on this family tree, um, uh, the names surrounded by dark frames are people whose trial documents have survived. It's the majority of the people. And then uh, the gray shades are people who were tortured. So we have evidence both from people who were tortured, from people who were not tortured, but who were members of their community. And I can compare what was said in the torture chamber to what was said uh, in interrogations that did not involve torture. Um, in these torture sessions, and here you have uh, more recent depictions, about 150 years ago, um, of uh, what, these, what these sessions looked like, um, there were scribes present at all times. You can see the scribe in the top left of the left image, uh, writing down word for word what was said in the torture chamber. Uh, and you can see the scribe uh, on the right, there's a torture instrument waiting in the corner, but torture hasn't started yet. And the scribe is writing down every word said, both by the members of the tribunal, by the lawyers, by the witnesses, by the torture victims. Um, that's why some of these documents run in the many hundreds, even in excess of a thousand pages. Um, and they are very, very detailed. So I'm going to pause for a second and have you read. Um, I'm going to have you read this, which is actually from uh, one of the documents in the Bancroft Library. It's very hard to read this and stay, um, you know, emotionally disconnected. It's it's really kind of heartbreaking. Uh, I I think of some of these people as my sort of indirect ancestors. Um, they are they are suffering terribly at the hands of the Inquisition. Even if they're not tortured, they're imprisoned uh, long periods of time. They are dispossessed. They are often exiled. They are shamed in public. Uh, their children are taken away from them. They're condemned to uh, hard labor or lashings. Many are burned at the stake. Um, but in this particular case, Francisca is, is actually being 
um, she's she's uh, she's being uh, tortured. Um, she's being tortured because she has something to hide. She is, in fact, a Christ, a, a Jew pretending to be a Christian. She's a heretic, uh, and she's deeply involved in Jewish practices. She celebrates the Jewish holidays. She raised her children in the Jewish faith. Uh, she engages in rituals. She cooks meals for Jewish uh, holidays that we're all familiar with. Um, and, and and the Inquisition knows knows enough about her involvement uh, so that when she is silent, they know that they need to uh, sort of interrogate her, interrogate her further. And her her heresy and the heresy of her uh, family members is uncovered. It's uncovered by a close friend of the family, Manuel de Lucena. Uh, you can see here yeah, his condemnation uh, of uh, Francisca and other members uh, of her family. So uh, the, there's, here's the, the, the ultimate uh, accusation uh, that they were Jews. Uh, there's the name of, in fact, if I, were, if I were somewhat fancy, I could even turn on a highlighter here. So I don't know how, how clear my how clear my cursor is but there's in the middle of the screen is the name of Luis de Carvajal the most famous member of this family uh arguably one of the most famous uh Jews to practice Judaism in secret in Mexico in this period um uh there's uh Doña Francisca is his mother Doña Isabel his sister Doña Leonor his other sister uh Mariana who is his uh third sister and then uh here uh on the bottom is um is the signature of, of Manuel de Lucena, who condemned them without being tortured. He was uh, isolated in a prison cell for a long time. There's a tremendous amount of information brought to bear by other witnesses against him. And uh, at some point he understood that the evidence against him was overwhelming and he collaborated with the Inquisition and betrayed uh, well over a hundred members of that underground Jewish community. At one of his last moments, uh, before the court, uh, they asked him to recite uh, a Jewish prayer. He recited the Shema prayer, arguably the most important uh, Jewish prayer uh, in existence. Um, he, he didn't just recite the prayer, he also showed how he prays. So he, he demonstrated how he puts his hand on his heart, and how he lowers his head, and how he moves his body when he prays. Um, and then here, here are the the words of the prayer as he uh, as he pronounces them. Those of you who are familiar with Jewish liturgy will recognize some of the words, but not all of the words, uh, either because the Inquisition scribe who did not speak uh, Hebrew didn't quite know what he was hearing and sort of wrote it down phonetically as best as he could, or perhaps because Manuel de Lucena did not know the name, the exact words of the prayer. Lucena is uh, a, a descendant of uh, underground Jews who have studied Judaism in secret since the start of the Spanish Inquisition. So for over a hundred years, they have had to practice Judaism without rabbis, without teachers, without official institutions. So he's learned this prayer word of mouth, and maybe this is uh, the, the best uh, recreation of the, of the prayer that he can uh, conjure up. And he is burned at the stake about a month later. Um, so, so I think these texts were very hard for me and I think very hard for Jose Adrian to read. I think they're very uh, sort of moving and, and emotionally difficult. I, I spent some sleepless nights pondering, uh, pondering these documents, but they also allow um, sort of cold calculating social science analysis. So what you see in this confusing table here I have sorted, if you just read from the top left down to the bottom, I have sorted uh, the trials of community members uh, chronologically based on the date on which they were arrested. So you can see a series of trials here that starts in 1594 and continues on to 1596. And these aren't all the trials. This, this is just sort of a, a random selection. And then I've shown here in the cross sections on each trial, who does the accused condemn? So Antonio Enriquez here condemns Beatriz Enriquez and Catalina Enriquez and Constanza Rodriguez and Justa Mendez and Violante Rodriguez. And then Manuel de Lucena, who we just talked about, condemns Beatriz Enriquez, who's uh, his wife, Pedro Enriquez, Catalina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can see all the condemnations and counter condemnations as people are accusing one another 
of uh, Jewish practices. And all of these people are, in fact, Jews. They are, in fact, uh, justly uh, accusing one another of Jewish practices. In bold are people who were tortured. So you will notice two things immediately. The first is the torture happens very late. Torture is not used to open up the case and um, uh, sort of successfully break through into the community and find out what the threads are that the Inquisition needs to follow. It's the opposite. Torture is used at the very end, 10 years into this entire series of trials in order to close the case, not to open it. And the other thing I'd like you to notice is that the people who are tortured, they do accuse a lot of their fellow Jews, but all the accusations are against people the Inquisition is already familiar with. So it's true that in January 1595, Violanta Rodriguez, under torture, accuses Manuel and Beatriz and Catalina. But these are people who've already been arrested. And there are people who have already been accused one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times by their predecessors. So torture is not used to reveal something new. Torture is used to confirm something that is already known. A function that for the Inquisition was very important, but a function that is very different from the way in which, say, the CIA tortures, which is torture to reveal new information. That's something the Inquisition did not do, and it's something the information did not believe in. So this is bad news for torture supporters. People in the United States today who say, yes, we should definitely torture terror suspects because torture is quick and torture can reveal all sorts of new and exciting information, that runs counter to the way in which the Inquisition used torture. But the Inquisition also used torture in ways that are counter to terrorism critics. Terrorism critics often say torture yields false evidence. You can't discover anything by means of torture. People will lie under torture. Well, that turns out also not to be true. Uh, this strange table here that you see on the left compares the people who Luis de Carvajal betrayed under torture with the people that Manuel de Lucena betrayed without torture. And there's a tremendous overlap between those names. They name their same friends, the same family members, the same community members, because they've prayed with them and they've worshiped with them and they studied with them and they converted them. Um, their names match to a large extent. What Luis says under torture is true. The Inquisition knows it's true, and in fact, the Inquisition knew it before they even tortured, ever tortured Luis. In the cases in which the names don't match, and you can see here that there are 53 names that Luis mentions that Manuel does not, and there are 43 names over here that Manuel mentions that Luis does not, names that cannot be corroborated are uh, not condemned at the auto da fe. So the Inquisition does not trust torture as a unique source of information about guilt and innocence. It also doesn't trust nonviolent interrogation as a unique source of information. It uses both. And in fact, this table misleads because the Inquisition didn't just correlate across two people, it correlated across dozens and dozens and dozens of cases, as you can see on this chart. The only people that were condemned at the auto de fe were almost exclusively people who Luis and Manuel both mentioned. And those were also the only people that were relaxed, which is code word for burned at the stake. Um, uh, Manuel and Luis overlap. Uh, there, there are 10 names here in the, in the sort of overlap zone. Uh, the 11th is Luis, who of course doesn't condemn himself, and Manuel, who doesn't condemn himself. All the others are, are names of people who were condemned both by means of torture and by means of not torture. So torture is used rather indifferently as one means of gaining information among many. The Inquisition searches your home for artifacts. You know, are you keeping a kosher knife for butchering? Are you keeping a holy text? Uh, are you keeping, you know, candle holders for Shabbat? Um, the Inquisition will interrogate your friends, your neighbors, your enemies without torture. The Inquisition will interrogate your friends, your neighbors, your enemies with torture. The Inquisition will intercept your, the letters you sent from prison. The Inquisition will place spies inside your prison cell 
to listen in on your conversation. So torture is just part of this set. And the Inquisition doesn't feel uh, particularly strongly one way or another about torture. They don't consider it to be beyond the pale, but they're also not enthusiastically embracing it. Over the course of 400 years of Inquisition, maybe 10% of the accused are tortured. And uh, uh, mo many of those who are tortured reveal useful information. Many don't. Uh, and some of those are then condemned and some are not condemned. So there's no relationship between being tortured and being found guilty. Torture is not a form of penalty. It's a form of interrogation. And if you provide the information we want by means of torture, we may well then set you free uh, without a penalty. Um, uh, or you may withhold information and we might conclude that you have simply have no information. Or you may withhold information and we may conclude that you deserve a punishment for withholding information. But there's no relationship between torture and penalty, meaning this is not, from the Inquisition's point of view, a form of sadism. It is a procedural matter. It is a form of questioning, which in my mind is arguably more terrifying. It's one thing to imagine an angry CIA operative who has captured an Al-Qaeda suspect or someone he thinks is an Al-Qaeda suspect right after 9-11 and, and just beating him to, to uncover truth. That's awful. But then compare that now to a Inquisition bureaucrat who tortures by following procedure. And they don't torture the most important suspects. They don't only torture the heads of the community. They torture anybody who is deemed to withhold information. Young, old, healthy, sick, male, female, children, the elderly, it makes absolutely no difference. They all get tortured in the same way, following the same cold bureaucratic procedure. If I had to choose between those two, and I'm glad I don't have to choose between those two, but if I had to choose between the two, I don't know which I would find more abhorrent. Okay, so some lessons, some very, very careful lessons. There's no denying it. Uh, when you hurt humans, they will provide you with information that they would not otherwise gladly provide. I wish that were not the case, but it is the case. It's very clearly the case. Uh, however, that does not happen quickly. This idea that a terrorist would plant a ticking bomb in Times Square, and I would then somehow catch that terrorist while the bomb is ticking, and I would identify that they are a terrorist while the bomb is ticking, and I would take them to the CIA headquarters and start torturing them, and the bomb is still ticking. And before the bomb explodes, I quickly torture them and discover where the bomb is and how to dismantle it. That is just silliness. It has never once happened in history. Not one element of the story I've just imagined has ever once happened in history. We have never caught a terrorist in the act. We have never interrogated a terrorist while a bomb was ticking. We have never dismantled a bomb in this way. It's a pure figment of the imagination and the Inquisition at least seems to demonstrate that torture takes, you know, months and years, really multiple years to work. The idea that you could do it in minutes is, is just ludicrous. And the idea that you can use torture as a fast and cheap method to get information is certainly something that the Inquisition would not have identified with. The Inquisition tortured under very unique conditions and the Inquisition was very skeptical of torture. So when uh, Luis de Carvajal in the torture chamber reveals the names of 119 fellow Jews, the Inquisition doesn't just run and round up those 119 Jews. It rounds up a small subset of those 119 whose names appear on other lists. I've heard their names before. Other witnesses have condemned them outside the torture chamber. It's part of a puzzle. Torture does not provide the picture. It provides a small part of the picture. And of course, we have to be extremely careful about how we apply these 300, 400-year-old lessons to something that's happening in the year 2022. Um, the Inquisition tortures for heresy, which is not something the CIA or the FBI are interested in. The Inquisition tortures for something you've done in the past. The CIA tends to torture you for your intentions in the future, which is much harder. The Inquisition has 300 years to perfect its practices. The CIA improvises. The Inquisition has infinite resources, a complete control over society. 
the full backing of the current government. Uh, no limits, no time pressure whatsoever. There's no ticking bomb. They can interrogate a community in the most remote parts of the Spanish empire for 30, 40 years. They are in no rush whatsoever. Um, so, I, so I think these lessons have to be applied with great care. But again, since we have no other source of information about torture, um, I found these documents in the Backroft and, and documents from other, other libraries to be uh, extremely informative. And I find the lessons sort of hard to ignore. That is my half hour. I'm going to stop screen share and uh, I would love to answer your questions. Yes, thank you so much, Ron. So, so folks, um, you may raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, you may put a question in the chat if, if you would rather have Ron or one of us read it out. Um, but please do use this time to, to ask Professor Hasner more about what he shared with us today. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep rambling and you don't want that. <laughs> um... Hi, Dana. Yes, I was wondering, Professor Hasner. So, you know, we have many forms of communication today, and it looks like they had a lot of written communication, but how would they uh, notify that you were going to be, uh, is that included in these documents, how you were going to be questioned and such? Would they notify you? How did they notify you? Uh, usually they would just come and arrest you. And then you would sit in the dungeons of the Inquisition. Um, and uh, part of what makes their procedure so cruel is that they would not interrogate you, let alone torture you, often for weeks and months. You would just sit there in isolation in a cell. Uh, unable they, to communicate with your family and such? Unable to communicate with your family. Or if you were very sneaky, like Luis de Carvajal, uh, I don't know if you remember, Diana, from, from all the conversations, what Luis did. Do you remember what he did? He he, how he was he... he was trying to convert his cellmate, which was a big mistake. Huge mistake. <laughs> Huge mistake. And he was making little notes, right? Trying to pass them on to his wife. He was writing them on avocado pits and then sticking those avocado pits into other fruit because avocado rots. So he would stick those avocado pits in, you know, apples and, and pears and whatever and smuggle them out of jail. But of course, the Inquisition knew all this and read everything. And the, the dude who sat in his jail who he was trying to convert was a pigeon stool, right? A stool pigeon, is that the right word, stool pigeon? Uh, a, 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 a snitch uh, on behalf of the Inquisition. Um, and so eventually you'd be brought up from your, from your cell. And I think based on what I've read about the history of torture, you would just be tremendously relieved to see human faces and to engage in any kind of conversation. You would have spent all that time in prison thinking, what do they know about me? What do they not know about me? Who else have they arrested? Luis can hear from his cell, his mother being tortured. Now, what is she telling them? How can I best protect her? Luis's calculation, I think quite rightly, and that is the same calculation his mother is going through is, I, since I know they've arrested her, I may as well condemn her. I've got to condemn someone so that I can get out of here. I may as well condemn her, it's too late for her, but hopefully they won't, they won't arrest Annika, my little 12 year old sister. So I'm gonna protect her and accuse the people who've already been arrested. Um, and then they will, um, they will warn you multiple times, three times outside the torture cell and then three times inside the torture cell that you are about to be tortured. Uh, the first time, and, and this again is brilliantly cruel, they will bring you into the torture cell to show you the torture cell, to sort of give you a tour of the facilities, which must've been terrifying, right? Because again, you. We now know what the Inquisition does, but people at the time had no idea what, 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 these, what these inquisitors were up to. So you come into this room and you see manacles hanging from the ceiling and you see this, this device made out of wood and ropes in the middle of the room and you see buckets of water and, and towels in the corner and, you know, and you ask yourself, you know, what is, what is this terrible place? And, and very often people confess then, right then and there without ever having to be tortured. Yeah, and when I say confess, I should clarify, um, contrary to common perception, the Inquisition was not interested in faith. It was, they did not want you to say, you know, I confess that I believe 
in the Jewish Bible. Why I confess that I believe in Jesus because the Inquisition was smart enough to understand that this was unverifiable, right? I mean, you can just claim it. Like, I can't prove it right or wrong. Confession here refers to admitting what you had done. So people are tried for practicing Judaism, not for believing in Judaism, for practicing Judaism, for lighting Shabbat candles, for fasting on Yom Kippur, for eating matzah on Passover, or similarly, they're condemned for practicing Islam, for burying their father in a white shirt with his arms uncrossed, because that would be the Christian manner of burial, um, for refusing to eat pork, for fasting on Ramadan. And those things are very viable, right? I mean, either you did those or you didn't do them. Uh, so that's 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 what sort of confession refers to. I see Jesse has a question. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is really really fascinating. Thank you, thank you um, so much for taking the time. I have a question about your um, comparisons with the um, uh, CIA. That the uh, CIA's methods are uh, random and that the information they're looking for is for something that you haven't done yet rather than something that you did. Um, since you had said that the information about modern instances of torture are kind of sketchy, um, I'm wondering where your information about the um, uh, CIA comes from, whether it's just like what we've heard in the media or if there's a more documented resource somewhere. There, there is, that's a great question, Jesse. There is no more documented resource. Um, and I was, and I'm highly skeptical about anything I've ever read from anybody about what the CIA is or isn't doing because we we just don't know squat. It's it's guesswork. Uh, so there's some investigative journalism. There are some tell-all memoirs, and they come from two sources. They either come from the CIA operatives who engaged in torture, and I'll give you the uh, TLDR, as my kids like to say. Too long, didn't read. Uh, CIA. Uh, memos from uh, uh, from CIA agents who engage in torture will tell you that the torture was fabulous and fast and efficient and revealed a ton of crucial information. And then you have FBI memoirs. The FBI did not engage in torture. And those all agree that torture was horrible and awful and a terrible waste of time and revealed absolutely nothing. And, and that's true even when the CIA and the FBI agents are in the room together talking about the same person. They can't agree on how often torture happened, what was and wasn't revealed, when did the person collaborate, what were the consequences, they flatly contradict each other. So, so where does that leave me, Jesse? Well, in the few cases where they agree, I assume that what they're saying is true. <laughs> so I looked for those cases. I looked for information from low ranking, um, some low ranking members of the army in places like Guantanamo Bay, uh, and uh, in some of the worst places in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, who described quite sincerely just the torture that they themselves had witnessed. Uh, and often it's so detailed that, you know, there's good reason to believe that what they're telling is true. And they describe sort of attempts to improvise torture. Uh, uh, one person was turning the air conditioning really high and then really low. One person was blasting rock and roll music really loudly and then strobe lights, and that didn't work. So they tried spraying the person with the uh, cold water hose, and that didn't work. So then, then you get sort of upgrade, right? Um, so, but so I read those with great skepticism. There are some government reports that have been declassified, but very, very, very few, very, very few. Uh, but the general impression one gets, and that's not surprising, is that the CIA, in the first years after 9-11, knew about as much about torture as the Inquisition did in 1493, they were still they were still making stuff up, and, and it was very interesting for me to see, as I was looking at documents from the early years of the Inquisition, I was seeing similar improvisation. I was seeing the Inquisition trying all sorts of methods that they would later on find out didn't work. So, for example, when I say that the Inquisition was very careful to torture late in the process to use the torture to confirm and not to reveal new information. That's something that took the Inquisition 40, 50 years to figure out. In the early years, they made the mistake uh, very often of uh, torturing in order to try to reveal new evidence. And you know, so they would walk into a small Spanish town, grab people off the street and just start torturing them. And of course, people would lie. 
Sometimes they would accuse people of heresy who were innocent. Sometimes they would claim that people who were innocent, uh, when in fact they were, they were heretics. Um, one super fascinating case uh, that I came across, uh, they, they tortured a woman who accused all of her neighbors of being secretly Jewish. And it took them about five years to find out that this woman was the village drunk. Uh, nobody believed a word of what she ever said. Uh, uh, she was just jealous of her neighbors who were all happily married. And so they brought her in a second time, five years later. By now, they had established a full um, picture of the entire town. They knew exactly who the head of the Jewish community was, who was speaking the truth, who was lying. They brought her in a second time. And this time they used torture in order to undermine the initial torture confession. And she admitted, she said, yeah, you're, I just lied. They're not Jewish at all. I was just jealous of them. Um, so here, torture serves the purpose of disconfirming prior rounds of torture. Um, that learning experience is something that perhaps the CIA is now undergoing, but it's not something that you would have seen in 2002, 2003, uh, when, when they were, you know, they were just making stuff up. Thanks. David, do we have a question? David, you're muted. I was going to ask uh, a third source of information might be the, of the vic from the victims themselves about the torture. Uh, although obviously um, you were talking about whether or not it's it's credible or not. But the other uh, bigger question is: Is there any hope of getting information from any of these bureaucracies that are conducting it, whether in our country or somewhere else? If we have not, what are we now? Uh, 70 years after the big French tortures in Algeria, and, and the French have still not opened their archives. Uh, the, the Americans have still not revealed all the details of Operation Condor, which was the, 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 um, the sort of torture campaign in Vietnam. Uh, the Soviets have destroyed most of the Nazi documents. I am now combing through some of the files of the Stasi, so notice, David, the, the kind of unique circumstance in which this has to happen. A government has to torture, keep very good records, and then essentially overnight, the government has to be replaced before they can burn any of the stuff. Um, but the Stasi also did not engage in torture quite on a massive scale the way the Spanish Inquisition did. We're lucky in a sense with the Spanish Inquisition that they documented everything meticulously and much of the stuff disappeared, but some of it somehow found its way to Berkeley, to Germany, to New York. Some of it is in Philadelphia. These sort of scraps have survived. Um, as a rule, David, victims claimed that they confessed nothing under torture. I said nothing. I was silent. I betrayed nobody. Perpetrators will say every victim we tortured told us everything we wanted to know. So again, these, these things can't be reconciled. We will never, even if one of these days somebody manages to declassify CIA files, we will never hear voices from inside the torture chamber the way the Inquisition provides literally transcripts. And, and you can see when you visit the Bancroft, if, if, if Diana and, and Hosedrin are kind enough, they will show you some of these manuscripts and you can, you can read the screams. I mean, there are screams on the page. Oh no, stop, my arm, it hurts, it hurts. You will never see any such evidence from the CIA. There was a story uh, a while back of um, um, uh, CIA agents at some black site who had videotaped some of their torture sessions. And then once the torture session was over, they destroyed the videotapes. Uh, so that, you know, none of that stuff will ever survive. I can't imagine it would. Alejandro. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding performativity. Earlier, you mentioned autos de fe, and um, those seem to contain a lot of symbolic regimentation with the regalia and processions. And so I was wondering, those unfamiliar with, if you could explain, uh, those unfamiliar with um, torture itself, that aspect, did those contain any performative elements? Did the torture contain performative elements? Yes. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I would say no, because it was done in secret. 
And the people were sworn to secrecy so that after they left the torture chamber, uh, they were not allowed to reveal what had happened there, how they were tortured, what information they revealed. Um, and the torture was conducted such that very often they did not show signs of torture after being let go. So contrary to the popular imagination, the Inquisition did not draw blood. It did not, as a rule, break bones. It did not burn its victims. It, it stretched them. It sometimes twisted their arms. It sometimes dunked them in water. Uh, but, but very often, once they left the chambers of the Inquisition, there was no sign to tell that they were tortured. The one performative aspect that is very interesting to me, and maybe also to you, is that this is, after all, a religious institution. So we might ask, if you already know everything there is to know about this community, why do you need somebody to corroborate it for you? If you already know that she is the village drunk and that she lied, and you already know this, why do you need her to say it? And the answer in part is a religious answer. This is a confession. And we need your confession to be a full and true confession so that you can then be forgiven and you can be purified. This didn't quite have a sort of ritual aspect to it, but the questions asked, the motions that the inquisitors went through, the order in which things happened was dictated by manuals that were essentially religious manuals. Uh, so this wasn't performative in the sense that anybody could see it. Only the people inside the chamber knew what happened there. Uh, but it was highly ritualized. And in a way that ensured that the traps that the CIA falls into, where you torture somebody too much, or you stop the torture because you, know, you think they've told you the truth, or maybe because you have compunctions. The, the Inquisition had no such compunctions. The, 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 the torture manual told them exactly what words to say, what questions to ask. And then if the answer is A, then you follow up with question number four. And if the answer is B, then you follow up with question number seven. And you go through this rigmarole step by step by step. I hope that I hope that answers part of your question, Alejandro. It did. Thank you. I warned you that I would I would ramble if you didn't ask <laughs> questions. So so let me ramble just for two more minutes, and maybe this will provoke more questions. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how this. You know, why should this matter in contemporary America and how can I use it for good? <laughs> like, how can I use this information in order to actually affect change? Um, and, and, and there is there is one way that I'll, I'm just going to throw out there. And if, if any of you are curious to read more about this, I've, I've published on it and I can I can share my, my publication on this. Um, and it has to do really with the cruelty of torture. So I think Americans misunderstand several things about torture. Um, uh, and one of the big misunderstandings is uh, uh, um, most Americans uh, feel that torture is effective and they are sadly correct in thinking so, but most Americans also, also feel that torture is very quick, that it's, it's a very efficient, cheap way to extract information on the fly. And that is absolutely incorrect. And so I did surveys. I conducted uh, surveys online of Americans to see how revealing more about what the Spanish Inquisition did, how this would affect American attitudes towards torture. And so I, you know, I pulled uh, 2,000 random Americans off the street. I did this online using uh, a questionnaire on, on Amazon, actually, um, and all sorts of fancy statistical methods. And I, uh, I asked them to engage in a hypothetical scenario in which a terrorist is captured and they know where the next terror attack is going to be. And someone is proposing to torture them by depriving them of sleep. Would you be supportive of torturing them by depriving them of sleep? I'm curious to know from the audience what you think, how many of the 2000 Americans I asked were in favor of torturing a terror suspect of sleep? Uh, if, you know, if, if you knew that the, there was a looming attack and this person had the information to prevent the attack, what do you think? Give me a number, Peter. What do you think? What percent? 80%. You're absolutely right. 75. Oh. <laughs> yeah, about 75%. Um, um, and then I said, uh, okay, but, but what, if this, what if this person 
provided only corrob corroborating information, not actually new information, but merely confirming what we already know, this doesn't seem to affect Americans at all. They were like, that doesn't matter. Keep doing it. 75%. We're in favor. But then I asked them question number three. What if this torture required me to deprive them of sleep for two months? Which is, in fact, how long it takes. It is, in fact, two months. The response rate dropped from 75% to barely 40. So this is instructive. Many anti-torture advocates today in the media, in academia, have tried to persuade Americans that torture does not work. In my mind, that is a futile pursuit. Regardless of what the evidence shows, Americans have convinced themselves that torture works and that it's justifiable. And if we keep arguing that torture doesn't work, we're just barking up the wrong tree. It doesn't affect American support for torture. You can scream, it doesn't work, it doesn't work until the day after tomorrow. Americans will continue to support it in very large numbers. But if you say to Americans, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but are you willing to do it for two months? Are you willing to do this kind of waterboarding? Are you willing to lock them in a dark room for so and so many weeks? This seems to be something that really dissuades Americans from engaging in torture. And so the research coming directly out of the Bancroft Library actually has real practical implications for anti-torture activism. And the lesson is very, very simple. If you want to convince Americans not to torture, describe torture to them in detail. Don't tell them it doesn't work because they won't believe you. Instead, tell them what it's like. Tell them what waterboarding is. Tell them how long it takes. Tell them how much it hurts. Share with them what victims scream when you do it to them. And this may actually have an effect on the way uh, Americans perceive torture and the, the degree to which they, they support it or refuse to support it. Ron, this is Peter. I wondered if you knew of the part of the collection that is at Bancroft, which is was already Peter, at... Peter, it looks like you're speaking, but I don't know if we can hear you. I can hear Peter. Can you not? I can hear him. I'm sorry, it was just me. Sorry, everyone. Go on, Peter. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I was asking about is whether you discovered that the collection at Bancroft has another component, which we didn't know about, and that's at the Huntington Library. And it's been there since 1908, I think. I only learned about it when I was preparing my remarks for your program the other evening at Magnus. And I don't know much more about it than that, but it is something that I thought you should at least know is there. Um, Absolutely. And you don't, and you, and you can't describe, now you say it's part of the Bancroft collection at the Huntington Library? What I did was to speak with Beverly Carno, the widow of Howard Carno, from whom Bancroft bought the collection. And she said when they were deciding whether to handle the collection that Bancroft bought, they discovered that the Huntington Library had had from a much larger archive, the other part of the collection that they were now being asked to handle. And it had been at Huntington, she figured out at that time, at least since the 1950s, but then I discovered further that apparently it has been at the Huntington Library since 1908. So I thought wow. you should know what's there if you didn't. And since you didn't allude to it, I began. No, I had no oh, idea. Oh, and oh. it's too late. The book is done. Um, I know that. <laughs> God knows I'm not going back. Um, but no, I'd, I'd love to see it. Now, I, I should say, Peter, this stuff is distributed across the entire world. Okay. In part, in part it's Napoleon's fault. Hmm. Uh, when, 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 he, uh, when he rampaged through Spain, uh, he kidnapped many of the inquisition documents and brought them to italy um and from there they were distributed to you know all four corners of the universe so you will find them at the hebrew university in jerusalem you'll find them at at various german universities british universities a huge collection at the university of pennsylvania um uh and part of my challenge peter was was not that i didn't have enough inquisition documents my problem was the opposite there were too many that i would go into this 400 year long archive and I would never be heard of again. <laughs> um, 
And so, and so I'm kind of glad that I didn't know about the Huntington because, because I would, you know, who knows uh, what I would have discovered, but it would, wouldn't it be great to know exactly what they have and what they don't have? I think that would be crucial. I haven't myself looked at a finding aid, if there is one, I did see a citation to it. So at least I know it's publicly accessible in the sense of amazing. But I, I will go ahead. I, I mentioned it to Jose Adrian, and I want I, something I think he really will want to know more about. But I, I since I only found out about it a, a, a week ago, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that he might not have heard of it before either. And, and no, making I, these documents public is is crucial. So Jose Adrian has been investing many many hours in his spare time transcribing some of the Bancroft documents meticulously, uh, and we're hoping at some point perhaps to find a way to both hire a translator and uh, and scan them, you know, do very high high resolution scans. I did scans of, you know, about 20 pages for the book and for the Magnus exhibit. Um, but it would be awesome if this were available to, uh, to the broader public and scholars everywhere could learn from it. No, I, I, um, I think, thanks, yeah, that I've, I've enjoyed working with the, with the documents. I, it's bringing back sort of the feel from from undergrad when I started working with those. Um, but yeah, no, I was aware of the Huntington manuscripts. I've seen I've seen a couple uh, when I was there uh, in grad school. So um, so yeah, so I've seen them, but it's they're they're just more. So the it it it's not necessarily anything new. It's just more of them. Um, in more cases, um, I don't think they have a finding aid that I've been able to sort of see publicly, um, but I know that they exist because I've seen them. The other um, important sort of resource uh, that I think will be uh, an important source run when, when looking at torture is the, the material that the university, that the law school at the University of Texas at Austin is compiling on the police archives from for Guatemala for the dirty war um, uh, in the late 70s and 80s. Uh, so that that has is a project where they have digitized a lot of the material that, that they have found uh, in Guatemala. The, the originals have remained in Guatemala and they just post the digital images. Amazing. Uh, yeah. at, at, at UT. And uh, there, there have now been um, instances where we know that the the heads of the the archive have been removed. Uh, they've they've been sent. Some of them have been exiled, because uh, when the Truth and Reconciliation um, Accord, after the accords, the peace accords, and the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission uh, came about in Guatemala, um, may, they have been using these cases to try a lot of the police officers who are still alive, and so people are you know finally being accused of, of the atrocities that they committed. And of course, there's a lot of folks who are not happy about that. So there okay. is there is some, there could potentially, I guess, be, be another resource there, but I, it's also, you know, it's still limited. It, hopefully it, the physical items will survive whatever regime changes happen in Guatemala as well, because I think that's, as, as you pointed out, that is the problem, right? In Peru, a lot of the materials for their, the, the Inquisition in Lima which started at the same time as it did in Mexico City in 1570, they've also lost many of the records because they've they've been destroyed so that it doesn't show this this horrible history right. of the country. So yeah. um, there is that there are those sort of interests too in, in what happens with those documents afterwards. So it's I'm glad they're here. Yeah. So that well, we I promised my wife not to engage in any more torture research. <laughs> uh, so so somebody else will have somebody else will have to carry that torch. Um, <laughs> It was depressing enough for the for the four or five years that I uh, that I dedicated to it, and I'm glad I did. And I, I could not have done it without the materials at the bankrupt. Oh. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ron, and everybody who had questions. I'm I'm sorry, Ben. We actually have to we have to uh, conclude now. It's two o'clock, and I know that Professor Hasner has has office hours to get to, and we need to let everybody else go. Um, please do join us next month for Adrian Sarah's talk on digitizing land, land records. Um, she'll be introduced by Mary Aliens, who's the lead principal investigator of this project. Um, so that promises to be quite interesting and um, enlightening. And I'd also just like to share with you the fact that we have our 
uh, Visualizing Place exhibition is, um, is happening at the Bancroft Gallery. It's a map exhibition that opened in September, and we would love for you to, to come by and see it. We are open Monday through Friday, except holidays, Monday through Friday, 10 to 4. So please do, those of you who can drop by and see it, I think you'll be very rewarded by the riches we have there. But again, thank you so much, Professor Hasner, for your talk today. Thanks everyone who joined us and we hope to see you all next month. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.